All right, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Mani Sajakpur. I'm part of the business development team for AWS Service Catalog. I focus on the East Coast and I work with our East Coast customers. I'm gonna be joined today by Dan, with Dan Newman and Krishna Gaduraju from Verizon. We're gonna go over the Verizon use case specific to the AWS Service Catalog a connector for ServiceNow. So we're gonna cover in this session is enterprise self-service. So how do I enable enterprise self-service for my customers internally? And we're gonna go over three kind of concepts. One is we're gonna go over the AWS Service Catalog connector for ServiceNow and how it integrates and allows you to do that through an ITSM system. We're gonna talk about central governance and how to enable that and manage that at scale and how Verizon is specifically accomplishing that. So let's kind of go over really quick what enterprise self-service goals are and what we've seen from customers we've discussed to what they're trying to accomplish. So a couple of things we've seen, right? You wanna accelerate your cloud adoption. You wanna make it easy for two types of users to be able to leverage AWS and be able to scale that across your entire organization. So one is the new users, right? You have new users who come into your environment and they don't know all the governance and controls you have in place and you need to follow. So let's say EBS encryption is a simple example. Maybe you have other compliance and security requirements you need to put in place. So you wanna make it very easy for those new users to be able to leverage AWS and be able to launch services within your environment on AWS. And then you have the other set of users which are more advanced users. You wanna let them experiment, you wanna let them, let them innovate and be able to do things at a fast pace and be able to leverage all the services and the features which are in AWS. And you also wanna make sure, make sure you meet all of your enterprise requirements. So standardization, consistency, tracking, auditing, reporting, and all the other good stuff that comes with encryption and security within your environment. So the way we see it is AWS Service Catalog kind of provides you that capability to be able to do enterprise self-service. What AWS Service Catalog does is we see this kind of balance. We see end users, whether they're developers or data scientists or any kind of end user who wants to consume AWS resources, would be able to do things in a fast, agile manner, in a self service manner as well, right? While you may also have fast time to market as well. But on the other hand, you have an organizational requirements, security, governance, you wanna make sure you tag everything, and you have all your compliance requirements in place. So Service Catalog kind of sits in between and kind of enables both for you to meet your standardization requirements and at the same time be able to have give developers or end users, whether they're data scientists or de developers, the ability to do self-service and have fast time to market. So let's go over how we allow you to accomplish that. So you take a CloudFormation template today, you can write it in JSON or YAML, and turn that CloudFormation template into a service catalog product. When it becomes a service catalog product, it becomes an immutable resource to the end user. So the end user who's going to be leveraging or launching that service catalog product will not be able to change the CloudFormation template. So what does that mean? That means I can add my constraints, I can put some security controls in there, I could, let's say, enforce EBS encryption, and I can do tag enforcement. So with Service Catalog, you could do up to 40 tags that are immutable that are added as a user launches it. We also have a feature called Auto Tags, which allows you to be able to uh, let users pick values which are specific to your environment. So let's say the key is, for example, environment, then the value can be, let's say, prod, QA, or dev. So once I do that, I take a CloudFormation template, I write all of my requirements in there, or I can copy an AWS uh, marketplace offering, an AMI offering into Service Catalog and it automatically wraps a CloudFormation template and turns it into a product. So once I do that, I can put that within my Service Catalog and offer it to end users. So here's a couple of examples of products you can build. You can, let's say, build an Amazon EC2 product, or let's say, run something with Redshift or S3, or you can put together a collection of AWS services. So it doesn't have to necessarily be service-based. For example, in the EC2 example, I'll build something with all of my requirements for a Linux machine. So if a developer or an end user comes there, they make sure, we make sure when they launch that Linux machine, they're meeting all of your compliance requirements. They're all correctly tagged, and let's say you can even constrain them in terms of what kind of EC2 instances they're launching. So if, let's say I want to launch the, let them only launch T2s within the dev environment, I would be able to do that. So here's some concepts around how you can do this within AWS and within AWS Service Catalog, and we're going to be using this term throughout the presentation. So a product is a Service Catalog product. It's a CloudFormation template that you in, insert into, into Service Catalog and it becomes immutable. It can have multiple versions. Each version would be a CloudFormation template and it could be anything from one AWS resource to multiple resources, so a three-tier stack or a single AWS resource. 
a portfolio is a collection of AWS Service Catalog products, and you assign IEM users, groups, or roles to that set of products. So I'm a user, I log in, I'll see five or six products, I have access to them, I'll be able to launch them. What you can do is add constraints on top of that as well. So I can add a constraint that, for example, Team A can only launch one, uh, one type of instance. So let's say they can only launch a T2 instance, for example. Or with the EMR clusters, I want to limit them in terms of the size of the EMR cluster they run, or I want to make sure they only run in a specific security group. The other additional feature that we provide is once you create a service, so let's say, let's talk about EMR. So if I create a product that's an EMR product, that end user who's going to launch that product will not necessarily have access to EMR as a service. So I can take access away from the underlying service while letting them still launch an EMR product. So that's all the functions that the service catalog administrator does. If you look at the upper half, that's what a service catalog administrator can do. And a service catalog administrator is a managed policy we provide within AWS, so you can leverage it and associate it to any IEM user. The bottom half is the kind of the user experience. So if I'm a service catalog end user, when I log into service catalog, I will see a list of products. I can pick any of the products that I want, I configure the parameters, and then I launch them. When I launch them, I get a provision product. A provision product is basically a confirmation stack that was launched with a specific identifier, which is the provision product ID. We recently added the capability to self-service actions, which is basically the ability to, if I log in, I launch an EC2, I want to be able to stop, start, reboot that machine. I can associate a systems manager automation document that to that specific product. So if I log in, I see an EC2, I launch it as an end user, I'll be able to stop, start, or reboot it, or add your own specific automation document. The end user will not have access to Systems Manager, but they will be able to do those specific actions on the given product. So now let's talk about connectors and going back to the enterprise self-service use case. We've had a lot of customers come back to us and say, hey, look, this is great. Our customers, our, in and our internal customers are used to being able to do, let's say, launch everything through uh, ServiceNow or through BMC or through ShareWell. So we built a connector for ServiceNow to give you that capability because, let's say, they order their pencils, their laptop, et cetera, through the service portal within ServiceNow. We want to give that same capability for them to be able to launch AWS resources from ServiceNow. We want to build workflows around it. We want to have, from an auditing perspective, have things in a configuration uh, management database or have configuration items associated with it and all the good stuff that comes with that. So we built the AWS Service Catalog connector for ServiceNow, and we launched it at K18, uh, the Knowledge18 conference for ServiceNow. We're on our third release of it, which we released last week. So if I'm an end user within ServiceNow, I can go to ServiceNow. Within the service catalog of ServiceNow, uh, there will be AWS Service Catalog products made available to them. You can copy AWS Marketplace offerings into AWS Service Catalog and provide it through that interface. It only requires the ITSM module within ServiceNow for you to be able to leverage it. And given the fact that Service Catalog uses uh, or leverages CloudFormation, you can basically provide any AWS service to your end users so they can go through the ServiceNow interface and be able to launch uh, any resource that they want. So let's take a look under the hood a little bit in, in terms of how the connector works and what the end users can do. So if I'm an end user, I could browse, I go to the service portal, I could browse all the products that are being made available to me within Service Catalog, I can pick the parameters that I want, and then I could launch it from there. So as soon as I launch or request a given product within Service Catalog, I, a service request would get triggered within ServiceNow. Now I could build a workflow around that. So let's say they're launching a really large EMR cluster, and I want to make sure their manager knows about it and approves it from a budget perspective. You can build that into ServiceNow for them to get that approval within the workflow. So once that approval is, uh, is, is provided, the end user can launch the, the, the ServiceNow connector for uh, the AWS Service Catalog connector for ServiceNow, sorry, will actually launch the product from uh, service now will make an API call across the AWS and launch that product, which is really launching a confirmation template in the back. So <clears throat> once that product is provisioned, which is the red arrows that you see, so it makes a request to provision the product, the product is provisioned, and all of the outputs that come from that CloudFormation template. So let's say I'm launching an EMR cluster, I, I get the ID back for it, I get, I get the endpoint back for it, or let's say I launch an EC2 instance, and I get the instance ID back and all the other information from it. All the outputs get associated to configuration item within ServiceNow. So I will have, let's say, in a provision product ID that's also maps to that specific configuration item. So I launch an EC2 instance, I will have one provision product ID, all the outputs from that CloudFormation template will get associated to that CI. 
we add another capability, which is we recently announced this. So if I'm an end user, now let's say I want to update it. So let's say I launch an EMR cluster or an EC2 instance, I want to be able to change that configuration. You would be able to do that uh, through the connector. So you can do an update, you can terminate that given product, and you can do self-service actions. So I can stop, start, reboot, or do any other systems manager or automation documents that you provide to the end user. So how does it work under the hood? Uh, there's two users, IEM users, that you are providing to uh, ServiceNow. You're configuring them within ServiceNow. There's one user that does read only. So that one user has the capability and it's constantly checking with AWS Service Catalog to see where all the new products are. And it grabs that information, provides it back to ServiceNow. There's another user, which is with the red arrow, which is the end user. That's a Service Catalog end user. You provide the permissions to that to do all the provisioning. So ServiceNow is really only calling Service Catalog. It's not actually calling the underlying services that, it, that are being launched. So let's look at it from a higher level. So if you have your AWS team and they're building Service Catalog products, all they need to do is build AWS Service Catalog products and provide them back. Your ServiceNow team will see all of those products and treat them like any other kind of product. They don't need to know all of AWS or all the AWS services. They see a bunch of products being available, made available to them. And then their ServiceNow team could build and associate, let's say, assign roles within, within ServiceNow and set workflows and do other things within that environment. Build change requests, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so with that, um, let's dive a little deeper into Verizon's specific implementation. So with that, I'm going to introduce Dan Newman from Verizon. Dan? Hi. Thanks, Marty. Hello, everybody. My name's Dan Newman. I'm an associate fellow with Verizon in the Global Technology Solutions Group. I'm here to give you a little background on Verizon's AWS journey and how we kind of uh, began to leverage the AWS Service Catalog Connector for ServiceNow and creating our Verizon Service Catalog to add value to our journey in the cloud. So this is a little bit about Verizon where I work. Um, I believe a lot of these brands here you guys are familiar with. You know, we're a technology company that's on the forefront of technology uh, with the best network and the best engineers looking to provide uh, value for our customers and our businesses. So uh, that was demonstrated here recently with our launch of the first commercial 5G service on October 1st. In staying with that message and that theme, within Verizon ourselves and our, in, our own internal uh, IT area, uh, we've decided that uh, in order to have uh, the efficiency, speed, and innovation that's needed to keep up with the business demand, we made a decision here recently to go all in with the public cloud. So initially, when we went all in with the public cloud, we decided you know, we need to make sure that, uh, as you can see there, we have a happy developer. We provided access to the console, and it was basically like Christmas. Look at all these new services. Very familiar with what was on-prem, very new to have all these services and features available to them within the cloud. Uh, this was done so that we could get a lot of uh, adoption. We could uh, identify where the value was in the public cloud with our particular developer space and, and businesses. And so as that started to grow, we started to realize that um, this uh, public cloud journey was becoming more of a reality as the developers started to identify business value that they could see and wanted to start running their code and their applications within production. So when that became something that we definitely wanted to do, we started to realize that all of the security and governance and rules that we had on-prem needed to have the same um, examples uh, created and instituted in production. So as we started to move into that environment, each of the groups that were responsible for those areas on-prem had to transition and merge and change to provide those same services within the pr uh, production cloud environment. And so as that happened, the automation began in a very distributed siloed model. And as you can see here, there's a laundry list of steps that developers had to go through to get from inception to deployment in AWS because we were maturing. And as we were maturing, our rules matured. And it was an ever constant growing learning um, time for our developers. And so here you can see some of the challenges that we ran into as we started to go down this AWS journey to merge into production. Obviously, there was a steep learning curve, and not just in having to consume the resources in AWS and understanding the new concepts of infrastructure as code, but also as we matured and grew in our areas of governance and security, those rules and those tools had to be learned by the developers as well. 
So a lot of remediation took place during those days, a lot of lessons learned, uh, a lot of our advanced users kind of drove us to, into areas we didn't realize we needed to be in because they started to you know, drive us to keep up with them. And that, of course, you know, hit operations. As new rules came out, as governance rules came out, documentation, getting the word out, developers needed to learn. So we took these challenges and we, we referred to those as opportunities. And we turned those into opportunities and decided to um, bring all those challenges together into an opportunity that became this high-level proposal to create a Verizon service catalog. The goal for this was to take all of those opportunities and to encourage the developers to give us feedback, provide us uh, direction on how they wanted to be able to consume and focus on consuming AWS resources while focusing on their application code. So as you can see here, uh, this is just a very high level uh, representation of what Mahdi was discussing around the connector between the service catalog and ServiceNow. Uh, what we didn't want to do when we came up with this solution was to hamper those developers who were further advanced, who had learned how to go through all the hoops and understanding the native components of code within CloudFormation to get AWS resources. But we wanted to start to bring together all of the distributed uh, governance and security rules that were out there, as well as start to kind of identify how we could centrally manage and provide a repeatable, solid platform for the developers to consume resources while at the same time focusing on their application code being deployed into production. So within the service catalog, we had uh, two types of patterns that we were providing access to the developers to uh, leverage. Uh, the standardized pattern was uh, ma basically made to kind of address a lot of those opportunities we, we talked about earlier. Um, it allowed us to start to define resources, resource consumption models, uh, wrap all the security and governance rules around it, all the goodness that we needed to have in order for their deployments not to be terminated, to be stopped, um, make sure that anything that got deployed that was out of the standardized pattern group would meet all of the current security and governance rules. So we make sure that all of the rules that um, are being generated by the groups that own those different areas have APIs and interactions that we could uh, leverage for this. And then for the groups that I referred to that are a little more advanced that have already gone out and, and did the legwork to create application-specific patterns, we wanted to make sure we accommodated them as well. And so that's why we also allowed the use of application-specific patterns in this area. So getting to a more centralized, federated model for managing the consumptions of resources within our area, bringing together all the goodness that was being generated from all the disparate groups uh, in charge of providing automation for security and governance, and working along with our developers to understand where we needed to focus and what patterns needed to be out there to make their lives easier, kind of came up with these two uh, patterns that were the most effective. So here you have, uh, again, a, a view of where we were at, where we were in the middle, and kind of what happened when we deployed uh, the service catalog into play. And so the developer steps are still accounted for. All of the onboarding, all of the automation, all of the resource deployments were now being cared for within those patterns I just mentioned. And so although there was a little bit of time added to uh, the before and after, that represents a lot of work in the enterprise hardening space that you know, just going into the console you're not going to get. Um, that's a lot of blood, sweat, and tears right there to get there. So that five minutes may seem like a little bit, but it, it, it's a lot. I mean, the team really worked hard to be able to provide all of that value in this space. And so I think as we started to move along this journey, we started to realize that um, taking the time up front to identify how we uh, lock these things down, how we uh, define well-architected frameworks in the resource model, at the end of the day was going to make for a better developer experience because now the developer could be sure that everything that he needed to do was being met. He could focus on his code and get to the job of building things. And so, as I mentioned, there's a lot of benefits that we uh, arrived from by using the service catalog. The user experience uh, was definitely the, the one thing that um, really started to focus, uh, we started to focus in on because um, leveraging CloudFormation template itself or consuming resources itself, um, if you were just to give somebody a questionnaire, that's not a lot of value. So 
doing a lot of intelligent population based on having a federated access model, knowing who you are, knowing what group you're in, um, what application you wanted to build for, really started to streamline that process of consuming resources and starting to you know, give that all concept of look ahead to really start um, giving that developer what he needed, when he needed it, even if he, don't, if, even if he didn't know that he needed it, because we knew he did. And so that kind of helped to really enforce compliance and security. And then, of course, if, if you're not having your resources destroyed because they're not meeting uh, compliance and security, I, I should say terminated, that's the right word, but you know, as a developer who would work the whole time and have it just blown up, you, all your work's destroyed. So <laughs> the operational efficiency was there because we didn't have the tickets. We didn't have people looking for documentation to understand why it failed. Um, and it allowed for consistency across multiple environments. And so with that, I'll bring up GK, who's going to show you all the nuts and bolts of how we got there. Thank you, Dan. You. Hello, all. My name is GK. I'm an architect for this service, no service catalog product. And so what we're going to look at now is so how we have built this product with ServiceNow and Service Catalog at the back end. But before that, how many of you are aware of CloudFormation here? Cool. So as you know, CloudFormation is um, infrastructure as a code service that, that would enable you to create a resource on AWS, right? And most of the organizations use CloudFormation as a, I mean, infrastructure as a service for that. Now, so as a developer, when I started the cloud journey, when I... Uh, when I'm supposed to move my application from AWS or on-premise to AWS, the challenge was not with respect to writing the cloud formation, but the challenge was understanding the governance and security practices, right? For example, Verizon has some, um, Verizon, uh, Verizon has some security practices that was in place. So one of the uh, security practices, for instance, was to, give the KM, to have a KMS key uh, encryption or to have an SSL certificate for elastic load balancer and all that stuff. Now, as an end user, um, you know, the focus should be for CloudFormation more than worrying about all the security and governance practices, right? Because that would be an, experience, uh, an end user experience killer. So the way we've done this is, so we have implemented um, a custom service now portal at the front end. And the way uh, it interacts with service catalog at the back end via connector. So all the automation is driven from the service now. All the work, uh, all the works, I mean, uh, workspaces and everything, all the workflows that is driven from the serv service now, uh, as you can see on the screen. So as Dan mentioned, we are trying to solve for two user personas. Um, one is a basic user persona, uh, and the other one is the ad advanced user persona. For the reason for the basic user persona is that, you know, when you start, when you're trying to migrate to AWS, you would start uh, like from, from ground, and you don't know what exactly is a CloudFormation template. What are the rules that are set in place for your company? So for those users, uh, we have developed the service now a UI that, that is very user friendly, and they can go and select a product and provision a product. Now the advanced user person, I, um, the user is someone who would know everything about CloudFormation, who knows how to use CloudFormation, who can create custom resources. So they would come to, uh, they would use a, a API which is proxy over APG, and provision the product at um, service catalog. So the workflows are uh, pretty straightforward. So we have authorization, publish, delete, provision, and we also have AWS Systems Manager, which I'll go over demos of each uh, of these workflows. So if you dive uh, deep into the service now part of the things, that's where we have put in a lot of effort for enhancing the end user experience. Now, as an end user, uh, when user logs into service now portal, User would see the list of products on the UI, and user can select any product. So product is nothing but a CloudFormation template uh, or a CFT. User can select the product and provision the product from service catalog, uh, which will be provision of the service catalog level, because the connector is the one that's connecting between service now and service catalog. Now, um, as an end user, when you go there, we would have to identify whether user has access to an account or user is part of an application team, or you know, whether user has access to a certain resource in AWS. So all, all the logic, everything that we have automated in service now. Now the other important part is um, the service catalog at the back end, right? So when the, the product is provisioned at the service catalog, 
it sends back the information to the to the ServiceNow UI via connector and stores that information in uh, in the DB as well at ServiceNow. And the crucial thing here is um, the ServiceNow also interacts with all important Verizon internal APIs. For instance, we have a uh, CloudFormation template, and the CloudFormation template has to be scanned for a static analysis using CFNAG. So CFNAG is a intelligent product which, which scans through the CloudFormation body and checks for um, you know, if, if there are any issues with the CloudFormation instance, uh, sorry, CloudFormation template. For example, if the template has the resources which are not compliant with Verizon. So we check all those things, and uh, our security team maintains the CFNAG API. That's one example. And there is governance API, which we interact with. There is AMI uh, creation API that, that we interact with. So all the APIs are taken care of from service now. End user uh, doesn't know anything about it, uh, which, which are happening at the back end. So user just focuses on writing the cloud formation and provisioning that. So as Dan mentioned, you know, standard patterns are for the, uh, the new users, because you know, when you start from first, you would need some standard patterns you, to start with. So the way we are doing this is um, we, are creating, we have created some standard patterns across our portfolio, our different portfolios, and we have identified some common stat, uh, standard patterns like EC2, RDS, um, you know, like Lambda and other uh, standard patterns. So once the standard patterns are available, they would be available as a uh, products in our ServiceNow UI where user can select and provision those products. This way, we are trying to adopt faster, and uh, new users can come to ServiceNow UI, and they need, they need not search for like CloudFormation templates, or they need not download them from internet. So they can directly use from here. And we, we are trying to increase the standard patterns through our inner sourcing model. So one of the crucial uh, part of inner sourcing model is that as, a, as an end user, um, you, know, you have used a standard pattern, or you want to contribute more to the standard patterns. Right? You can contribute the standard pattern via automation that we have in place. Like we have used a CI/CD flow for inner sourcing uh, in, in, in Verizon, which I will go eventually. And we also are trying to increase, I mean, improve the governance and best practices in, in the CloudFormation template. So as an end user, when you see the standard pattern, the standard patterns are created based on the best uh, practices from uh, Amazon, which are recommended by Amazon. And then those, pa those patterns also have the governance tags and whatever our Verizon security requires. So users will try to understand them and then try to provision the products. Ultimately, we are making sure that you know, uh, by doing this, we are trying to go faster to AWS. So these are some of the uh, common standard patterns. Um, I'm sure you, are, you all are aware of, of that uh, EC2 is common standard pattern that users generally use and RDS, and Lambda is one com a blueprint that we have created for our serverless, work, uh, serverless uh, teams. And Amazon S3 is another standard pattern. So this is the portal. If you see the list of products that are appearing here are from the service catalog at the, black, uh, at the back end, which are published. So the products that are in the service catalog at the back end are um, synced across to ServiceNow UI via connector. And the products have the product names. The products are like CFTs. They have the names. They have the descriptions, the actions, and details of what exactly the CloudFormation template does and the number of resources. So when I said inner sourcing, you know, um, since we deal with big enterprise, I'm sure you all have dealt with, uh, you work with enterprises, and we have thousands of applications and 100,000 employees. We have to reduce the amount of uh, redundancy where each developer will go through while creating the cloud formation template, right? So we have we have created that culture of sharing the cloud formation template across different LOBs. So the way we have done it is we have created a common repo, a cloud share repo, um, which is which is Git, and we. Uh, let users contribute their CFTs to, to that repo. So for instance, um, if you want to contribute an EC2, which is not part of the standard repo or um, standard pattern, uh, which you want to modify that EC2 template, a developer can come to the Git repo and make a pull request. 
So what happens at pull request is somebody would approve the pull request, and then it would trigger a Jenkins job. The Jenkins job will publish that um, product by staging that S3 bucket, by staging the CFT in the S3 bucket. So Jenkins will place the CFT in S3 bucket, and then you know our Lambda function will trigger as soon as it sees um, an object in S3, and then it will publish that product to service catalog portfolio. Madi has mentioned about the portfolios at the back end. So portfolios are the collection of CloudFormation products at the back end. So in this case, we are just using uh, hub and spoke model. I I'll get to that in the next slide. So hub and spoke model basically is where you can share um, from one portfolio to different portfolios. And this is one cool feature that Service Catalog offers. And, and the reason why we're using this feature uh, at the back end is as a standard pattern, when you share it to one portfolio, um, and it has to be available for all the users from diff uh, different LOBs. Portfolios are like LOB accounts or you know, business units. So we published a uh, CloudFormation template to the shared services portfolio. And then from there, it will be published to all the LOB accounts. So users from different LOB accounts can see the standard pattern that was contributed, and they can start using the uh, CloudFormation template. I'll quickly go through a demo of standard patterns and provisioning. So this is a typical um, pull request or CI process. You know, so we have our repo, and Tom here is trying to make a pull request on the Redshift CloudFormation template. So he would go to Git repo and he would look for all the CloudFormation templates that are in there. And if he wants to contribute any uh, CFT which is not part of the standard, then he can make a pull request, and then that would be. Uh, you know, reviewed by one of our teams, they would approve the pull request. So that would go through a Jenkins process of evaluating whether the CloudFormation template is, um, you know, compliant with Verizon best practices. So as I've said, CFN NAG is the main API, API uh, that scans through the CloudFormation template. So CFN NAG check happens at the Jenkins level, and Jenkins will um, make sure there are other checks and then sends an email to the user whether the comp template is you know, compliant or it, it is ready to be provisioned. So once this step is done, it will be published to AWS Service Catalog. And these are some of uh, the products that we have at the portfolio level for shared, service, shared services account in Service Catalog. So as an end user, you know, um, when user logs into the portal, user will see the different products over there and the details and the descriptions of the product. So if I want to provision, like for instance, EC2 app install, which is one of our product with um, user data, we give user an options, options with all the portfolio accounts that he has access to, the AWS accounts that user has access to, and template body, and also the summary of, um, and also summary of uh, the CloudFormation template. The summary contains uh, information related to the number of resources that uh, the CloudFormation template has, and the product name. And it also checks whether the CloudFormation template is compliant. Uh, you can see that it has a CFN NAG validation, which is done. It went through the CRS check. And these are some of our internal Verizon checks uh, that the template has gone through. And one good part here is um, the AWS resources we scan through the CloudFormation template body and we identify what are the resources which are part of the CFT. That way, if user is using any resource that's not um, approved by our Verizon security, then we would disallow user to use this CloudFormation template. So user can select the account, one account where user wants to provision and region, US, East, and West. Um, once it is... Um, one second. I just want to focus on this one because this is where we have put in a lot of effort. And for this, you know, you can see the template body. So ServiceNow scans through the whole CloudFormation template body. We're not trying to replicate console here. We're trying to help user to fill in the parameters. Like some of the parameters could be Verizon specific. So Verizon specific parameters we fill in automatically for the users by making an internal, you know, API calls. And any parameters that is, um, which is more like what user has to fill, then obviously user would fill it. And some of the parameters, if you see here, you know, instant types. Instant type is the types of instances. There we have an opportunity to, to restrict the types of instances that we support in Verizon. 
and we are making this internal API calls. It, it is maintained by one of our internal team. Similarly for AMIs, AMIs are maintained by um, our governance team. So we make an internal API call to that team um, and then get all the information for, for AMIs. And similarly for IAM role, KMS keys, we go through our security APIs and get that information. So that way, you know, uh, for an end user, when the user selects this product and see, look at, looks at the CloudFormation template, it is automatically populated. It has automatically populated all the information. Maybe user have to just enter a few other parameters which, which user uh, is aware of. And we also support the API, as I've said, but I've, I was just focusing on the UI. If user knows what is a JSON body, user need not even come to the UI of service now. User can make an API call to our APG, uh, which is the gateway for our APIs of service now, and, and provision this product. So every uh, request will have a return number. Return is a service now terminology, which is a request number. And the return will have the workflow steps. So user can check, uh, look through the workflows and understand what, what, is, uh, what is happening at the back end. These are real-time information. So um, once user is aware of all these things, user can also click on the product, provision product. That's again the terminology of uh, Verizon combined with AWS terminology. And user can go through the output resources and events and all the lifecycle requests. So, so on this screen, you see different tabs, which are combination of AWS APIs and, and Verizon APIs. So lifecycle is something which is more specific to Verizon. But request is also a, a service node terminology. And API is where we uh, give user information to provision this product via an API. As you can see, it got succeeded. And this information for the provision products is only available for that user. So if I'm the owner of uh, the product, I, I would see only this information for all the provision products. So that way we are making sure that you know, users who are trying to provision products, only they would know whatever they're trying to do. And we are trying to restrict that from service now. Now standard templates, standard patterns are more specific to the new users uh, because it has resources, maybe one or two resources. For instance, EC2, RDS, or Lambda. But what if user is more advanced or a Tom in previous case uh, who was a new user is more advanced now. He wants to um, use an application-specific pattern, which means that he can create a complex pattern that that consists of two or three or four four or more resources together, right? So we have we are allowing that uh, specific person of advanced user as well, where um, advanced user can bring in his or her uh, her cloud CFT and publish that in service now. So the published part here is little different from from the standard patterns. Because for standard patterns, we have used a CI CD process of um, Jenkins and Git and everything because we want to share across all the LOB accounts. But for application specific pattern, we are trying to publish the CloudFormation template to ServiceNow directly. And all the CFTs are maintained at ServiceNow. So this is more application specific and users um, who are working on maybe app migrations to AWS they would, they would have these CFTs, and uh, it has maybe complex user data and all the stuff. And the reason for uh, why we are allowing this is the standard patterns will have an EC2 or maybe an RDS, but custom combinations based on our research has more complex uh, CloudFormation templates. And this also helps developers to bring in their own CFTs, and, and this is helping the developer autonomy so obviously, all these steps would encourage our uh, both user personas to use the CFTs and you know, go faster to AWS. So the flow of application-specific pattern from the developer perspective is once user uh, has a CloudFormation template, would go to ServiceNow UI or an API. I'm not stressing on the API. I'm just focusing on the UI for this slide. So ServiceNow UI and upload the CloudFormation template. So once the uh, template is uploaded, the template goes through the CFN nag. Again, the static analysis checks. And we make sure user has access to the account where he's trying to upload the CloudFormation template and the application which the user has access to. So if you can see on the slide, it is making API calls to CFN nag 
and then once service node gets back the information, it verifies the information, it makes a call to the connector, the connector will publish the cloud permission, uh, the CFT to uh, the service catalog portfolio. And once, once it is published there, connector will again sync up and show the uh, CFT for application specific on the application specific page on the service now UI. So we have created two separate pages for this because we want to keep standard and application specific patterns differently. So all the blueprints or standard patterns will be on the UI which I, which I was showing you before and application specific will be on a different UI. So for app specific patterns, we are targeting just one, L, one LOB account at the back end. We're not using hub and spoke. The reason for that is, you know, um, application specific has to be for that specific portfolio or, or an LOB account. And it makes no sense to share that across different LOB accounts. And it, it also has, I mean, users might have some sensitive information for that application, you know, specific cloud formation template. So in this demo, I'll show you how user can publish the cloud formation template for the specific app, um, account and application. So again, user would come to ServiceNow UI. We will check whether user has access to account. User will say, uh, select the account if he has access to, and then region which the product has to be published. So it goes to the CFN NAG scan, and it went through the scan in this case. And as soon as the scan is done, our, our service now will scan through the CloudFormation body and show the resources. In this case, I'm, just, I'm using an EC2 with ELB and autoscaling group. And all the resources are displayed here with respect to the CloudFormation template user would, would give the product name because the product name um, is also the same name which will be published to the service catalog as a product and the description. So if you pay, uh, if you, um, pay close attention to the bottom part where we have green uh, ticks, that symbolizes that user has satisfied all the prerequisites for this CloudFormation template. Uh, for instance, if this, this CloudFormation template has um, ELB and the requirement in Verizon is that we, we make sure every ELB has an SSL. And for instance, if user doesn't have an SSL certificate for this ELB, we block the CloudFormation template and we'll let user to create that SSL before this template should be published, will be published. So once the template is verified and it is, it is ready to be published, user can publish that. It goes through the request page. And the request page, um, user can see the workflow of the request page. Again, it's the same concept. User will have a return of service now. It goes through the different checks and all the workflows. So once everything is done, the product will be published to that specific portfolio account at the back end. User can use uh, this published product now to provision this product. So this way we are uh, supporting application specific or you know, uh, custom combinations of CloudFormation templates. So the other important feature that we have launched two weeks back, and our developers are very excited about this feature, is how we want to allow configuration management for our, uh, our provision product. As you all know, configuration management is like how you would configure your EC2 instances. You know, typically you would use Ansible or Puppet or Chef or all those tools. And for this use case, we are trying to use, we used SSM. So AWS SSM is a systems manager which is an agent-based uh, configuration management tool or patch management tool. And they also have use cases where you could use uh, this to install software or configure your EC2 instance. So end users, once, uh, if they have a provision product and the pro product has an EC2 instance, so we, we check whether the product has an EC2 instance and we make a call to SSM. SSM has run documents. So run documents are uh, nothing but the, document, the documents that user would use to run the commands, right? So here we are using shell script, and we also enabled Ansible, which is not in prod. Uh, so shell script document will be called, and the shell script document will make a call to SSM API, and ultimately the shell, shell script will be run on the instance, and the output will be shown, shown to the user. Before uh, this script runs, we also encrypt the shell script in service now, and we store the information of the whole script that way you know, um, we have the whole audit information from our, from our security perspective. 
if security team needs, like, you know, who executed what script on, on an EC2 instance, we have whole information in, in our service now database. AWS also d uh, maintains this information via command ID for each command, but that has some, I mean, limit for the number of days it, it stores that information. But with respect to our case, we are storing that in service now too. So in this uh, demo, I'll show you how we have implemented SSM and how end user experience would be when trying to execute the command. So as you know, uh, the provision products page will have the list of the stacks or provision products, right? And here, for this product, we check whether it has an EC2 instance, and it has this EC2 instance. So, if you see there, okay, in the output section of the provision product. Now, user will have an option to run command as soon as our check is done. User can click on run command. This will open up a pop-up page uh, where user can select the EC2 instance and copy the shell script and paste it on the UI. So in this case, I'm just trying to execute a web server shell script uh, with the comments. The comments are useful generally for um, other application team members who to know what you know, one of their team members has executed on, on that instance. And the timeout is for um, SSM because the timeout is the time of the duration which the script is running. So we, we have put 300 seconds uh, as a default, but user can change it if he wants a quick response from SSM. Now, once that is executed, um, it goes through the request page again. User can select the request um, of the output of the request, and it has a command ID, product information, a request time, and who has requested that. And it also sh shows the command that which, which I have executed in this case, the shell script, and the output of the shell script. So um, you can see here the output shows whether it, it has been successful or failed. So for, I have executed for one EC2 instance, and it's for a web server installation, and I install web server, it shows the output. And if there is any um, truncation with respect to the output, it is because SSM allows only 2,300 characters for output. So we can only increase the limit by allowing that to be part of an S3 bucket. So with that, I'll hand it over to Dan for the takeaways. Thank you. Thanks, GK. <clears throat> so as you can see, there was a lot of time and effort put into um, creating what we would hope would become a more and more frictionless development environment as we move forward into our cloud journey. So um, a lot of what we talked about here was around focusing on that developer experience. As you start to mature in your governance and security policies, as your developers start to mature in the services that they want to consume and leverage to build applications to push the business forward, make sure you understand how the changes that you make and the decisions you make impact that developer experience. Because uh, we, are, we all understand the importance of security and governance and being able to manage enterprise um, resources at scale. But we also want to make sure that, you know, as we move forward into a, a more agile environment, uh, trying to drive the business forward in a faster uh, uh, speeds, that we want to make sure that that developer experience is accounted for. So a lot of the iterations and a lot of the work we did was around making sure the end result was the outcome of security and governance, but constantly um, reiterating and testing and making sure that that developer experience was getting better, that the, that the needle was, was turning. Uh, the federated user access and a single interface for developers, there are a lot of tools out there, there are a lot of ways to manage these environments um, and coming together into a centralized place so that you minimize the operational and documentation impact um, and you also have a good place to uh, run test cases and um, know that you have uh, ensure, you, you can ensure reliability and, and repeatability in everything you're doing. And then the leverage of standard patterns to drive well-architected solutions. Um, you know, snowflakes are out there, and uh, with lift and shift prevalent in the public cloud, they're still going to be there. But in order to, to really uh, drive to more transformation and to better use of the public cloud, 
being able to, to make the, the journey for the developers and consuming well-architected solutions via standard patterns is one of those ways to really drive faster migration into a proper um, configuration in your, in your public cloud space. Um, and one thing I, that, that isn't up there, but I want to make sure that you all take away, that this framework, although it was very specific to some of the tools and the use cases of Verizon, is very customizable. And I would say that uh, you should look at this, identify what's needed in your space, what do your developers want, and take what you've learned here and figure out how it applies back where you're at. And as we say at Verizon, go out there and build more awesome. Thank you very much.